Um, I'm Maureen Dunn. I work with the Chevron Richmond Refinery, and Chevron is an industrial discharger and a dredger, so I'm excited to introduce um, the next topic. Um, I'm going to introduce Robert Schliff from the Water Board. He is a uh, senior water resource control engineer in the San Francisco Water Board NPDES permitting section. He has over 20 years approximately 20 years of his time with the Water Board working on permitting and enforcement actions for municipal and industrial wastewater treatment plants. Robert? Well, thank you for that nice greeting. Um, so to start the afternoon session, I'm going to be giving the regulator perspective on industrial wastewater discharges to San Francisco Bay. So while most industrial facilities um, discharge to municipal sewer systems under um, pretreatment programs, we do have a number of industrial treatment plants that discharge directly to the bay, and this is a map showing um, all of them. So um, to start, you can focus on the red circles with stars in the middle. Those are the five petroleum refineries. So there's the Chevron refinery here in Richmond, um, Phillips 66 in Rodeo, the Valero refinery in Benicia, and in Martinez, there's two refineries. There's the Shell Refinery and Endeavor Artesoro. Now, there's also a number of other industries that discharge directly to the bay. In San Francisco, the Exploratorium, they discharge once through cooling water. In Oakland, Schnitzer Steel, it's a metals recycling facility. They normally discharge to East Main Valley, but during wet weather, they'll discharge directly to the bay. In Crockett, we have a sugar refinery. They um, process 800,000 tons of raw sugar annually, and they discharge once through cooling water and um, wastewater to Carquina Strait. In Martinez, there's a sulfuric acid regeneration plant, and they discharge wastewater to Carquina Strait. And finally, in Pittsburgh, USS POSCO, they're a steel finishing plant, and they discharge once through cooling water and wastewater to New York Slough that flows into Sassoon Bay. But today I'm really going to be focusing on the five petroleum refineries. And the reason for that is um, they discharge about five times as much wastewater as all the other industries combined. Now, for perspective, you can see that the municipal wastewater treatment plants, they dominate the wastewater flows to the bay. And if you were to collectively add um, all the wastewater discharge from these three um, categories, it's about a half a billion gallons of wastewater that gets discharged every single day. So um, to start, I'm going to give like um, a little bit of a regulatory background. Um, Bill talked about this a lot this morning. He had four slides that he repeated a number of times. I'm just going to do it in one slide. So. <laughs> so the way I look at it is we kind of have three types of limits that we use to um, protect San Francisco Bay. There's technology-based limits. So for the refineries, this is going to be based on the amount of crude they process and specific refinery processes. And um, these technology-based limits, they were developed by US EPA, and they're supposed to be um, a reasonable level of treatment given the economic needs of industry. Now, they're not enough to protect beneficial uses, so we also include water quality-based limits. So this could be for like a specific pollutant like copper. We'd look at the ambient levels in the bay, the objective that needs to be um, met to protect aquatic life, and then we'd set a limit to ensure that the receiving water does not exceed that objective. And then finally, we need to regulate unknown toxicants. And we do that by including whole effluent toxicity limits. So um, to comply with this, dischargers basically expose sensitive organisms to their effluent, and they measure for sublethal and lethal endpoints. So um, that's a little bit of background on our regulatory approach. So now I wanted to talk about kind of the major permitting milestones for the refineries. And this is just going to guide the rest of the talk. So in 1982, the US EPA um, promulgated technology-based limits for the petroleum refineries. And after complying with those limits, there are really two significant treatment plant improvements the refineries had to implement. One was for toxicity reduction that started in the late 1980s, and the other was for selenium reduction, which was in the mid to late 1990s. Now, another key permitting milestone, and the reason we're all here today, is the Regional Monitoring Program. Um, they started collecting um, water quality samples from the Bay in 1993, and data collected under the RMP has really allowed us to develop total maximum daily loads for pollutants that are impairing the Bay, such as mercury, PCBs, and selenium. 
Okay, so to start, toxicity reduction. Um, in the mid-1980s, the refineries, they had a lot of issues with their effluent being toxic. They would take juvenile fish, they'd expose it to their effluent, and they would just often die. Um, but they, they looked into this, <laughs> and um, they figured out that the cause was a biodegradation product of petroleum hydrocarbons called naphthenic acids. And naphthenic acids, they're a bit tricky because they don't really behave the same way as the parent hydrocarbons. Um, most importantly, they're polar compounds, so they dissolve in water, which makes them more difficult to remove. So what most of the refineries did is they installed these granular activated carbon units on the back end of their treatment systems. And the activated carbon basically absorbs naphthenic acids and other toxic pollutants. And the result is, is that they can expose um, juvenile rainbow trout to their effluent for 96 hours and they will survive. And this is actually a, a photo of a toxicity test at a local refinery. And if you look really closely, or maybe just use your imagination, there are actually little fish in here swimming around in this container. And um, this is really a cornerstone of how we um, regulate refineries. We require these 96-hour flow-through tests every single week. So um, the next big um, change was for selenium. Um, so this is just a chart showing the huge selenium reduction that occurred at the five petroleum refineries. So you can see in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the collective selenium load in kilograms per year was um, around 2,000. And then by 2010, 2011, it's a little bit under 600. So there's about a 70% reduction in the selenium load to North San Francisco Bay. Now, another interesting thing about these treatment plant improvements is it actually changed the speciation of selenium discharge. So in 1987, about 25% was in the organic form, 11% was selenate, and 64% um, was selenite. Now, after the treatment plant improvements, you still had 21% in the organic form, but 53% was selenate, and only 26% was selenite. And this is really important because um, selenite bioaccumulates much, much more than, than selenate. So not only did you get this 70% reduction, but the selenium being discharged is a lot less bioavailable. Now, there's always this question of, you know, you have these big reductions at a treatment plants, and it's like, do you actually see it in the bay? And this is a slide showing that you definitely do. Um, this is selenite in North San Francisco Bay. So on the vertical axis, we're just looking at selenite in parts per billion. And on the horizontal axis, this is just the location of the bay. So we're going from the Golden Gate all the way up to the Delta. So if you just focus on these orange or red diamonds, you can see selenite coming in from the delta. It's pretty low, and then there's a big increase, and then it goes down. And this is from a sample taken in September of 1986. And right around here, this is where the petroleum refinery is discharged. So there's a clear signal that they're causing increases in selenite in North San Francisco Bay. And even in wet weather, there was a sample in April of 1986, these blue circles, and you see about a doubling, then it goes back down. Now, after the treatment plant improvements, there were similar samples collected in September of 2010 and March of 2011. That's shown by these triangles and X's, and you see the selenite, it's pretty consistent. So, I mean, this seems to show that the treatment plant improvements that they did had a large effect on um, water quality in North San Francisco Bay. Okay, so that kind of covers the two huge treatment plant improvements they made. But as um, the theme of this year's Pulse of the Estuary is pollutant loads to the bay or pollutant pathways to the bay, I wanted to talk a little bit about TMDL implementation, because that's what we've been doing in permits over the last 10 to 12 years. So um, to start, um, we started implementing um, mercury allocations in wastewater permits in 2008. And this is just a pie chart that shows the TMDL allocation. And you can see here for mercury, it's non-wastewater sources that really dominate. Um, municipal waste, wastewater treatment plants were given an allocation of 11 kilograms per year. And refineries and industry, it's a little green sliver on this pie chart. They were given one kilogram per year. And as you can see, the loads from refinery and industry are about 70% below their allocation. So they're, they're not a significant source of mercury to San Francisco Bay. You can see something similar with PCBs. Um, we started um, implementing PCB allocations and wastewater permits in 2011. And this pie chart shows that about 80% is non-wastewater. Municipal treatment plants are more significant. They're about 20% of the PCB allocation to the bay. 
And then refinery and industry, again, they're just like a green sliver. They're a little bit less than 1%. And similar to mercury, their, their loads in 2018 are about 60 to 70% um, below their allocation. Now, as for selenium, this is a bit of a different story. So we have a TMDL for North San Francisco Bay for selenium. And um, we started implementing this in refinery permits in late 2016. And this is a pie chart that shows, again, non-wastewater kind of dominates. But the refineries, this green pie chart, you know, it's much more significant here. They're about 11% of the load, even um, after those significant improvements that they made in the late 1990s. And you can see here, municipal and industry, they're about 2% of the load. And so this is pretty significant, because when I showed at the start, the wastewater flows from the refineries, they're like relatively small, but there's still a big portion of the selenium load to the bed. And in 2018, um, they discharged about 520 kilograms. So they're about 10% below um, their allocation. So um, that kind of covers kind of the main permitting um, issues we've had over the last like 30 to 40 years with the refineries. Um, but I wanted to like leave you with some kind of future challenges that, that we're facing. So as for everyone, climate change adaptation is a big deal. Um, for the refineries, this could mean requirements to use recycled water instead of potable water. The um, Chevron re refinery already gets more than 50% of their water from a local wastewater treatment plant. And um, as we experience more droughts, we envision more partnerships forming between um, municipal treatment plants and nearby refineries. And then um, finally, like another um, challenge may be the need to optimize selenium reduction. As I mentioned in the previous slide, they are relatively close to their, their allocation. Okay, well, we'll take questions after Bridget speaks. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Robert. Uh, Bridget DeShields has over 30 years of experience um, and is a special in consulting and is a special specialist in regulatory strategy, site investigation, risk assessment, site remediation, sediment and water quality management, and environmental toxicology. And Bridget also represents the five Bay Area refineries on the RMP Technical Review Committee, right? Well, I just want to ask a quick question of everybody. I don't think it's been asked yet today. How many people don't have power at home right now? Wow, you guys look pretty good for getting dressed in the dark. So good <laughs> job today. <laughs> so um, now I'm going to, for those people who don't have the power, try to enlighten you about <laughs> the discharger perspective on industrial wastewater. That was my feeble attempt at uh, some humor. <laughs> Okay, so a little bit of industrial wastewater 101. Robert uh, Robert started this process, so he showed you a map of the bay and <clears throat> sorry, recovering from a little cold, but um, where the where the industrial dischargers to the bay are located, including the five Bay Area refineries. Of course, we know that industry is very important in the Bay Area. Um, industry is booming in the Bay Area, not just petroleum refinery, but other industries. But you saw that there are very few. Um, industrial dischargers to the bay. There actually are a lot more industries that have discharges, but they tend to discharge to municipal systems through pretreatment programs. So I just wanted to point that out. So there are um, a relatively small number of industries that discharge directly to the bay. Industrial wastewater um, is highly treated and highly regulated, as Robert talked about. Um, a difference between municipal wastewater and uh, industrial wastewater is that in industrial wastewater, uh, we know a lot more about what's coming into the system, where municipal wastewater, of course, they're getting whatever comes down the pipe from what, whoever's um, putting it down the pipe industry and, um, of course, homes and, and the like. <clears throat> so in refineries in particular, we know that our, our source material is crude oil processing. Because we know what the sources are, um, we can actually... Uh, work to control those sources because we understand them. So uh, Robert mentioned um, some some um, toxicity reduction or treatment uh, or um, source reduction activities that were done way back in the uh, beginning of the Clean Water Act, and um, there's also pollutant minimization that's possible. Um, for most pollutants, uh, industrial uh, wastewater, as Robert showed, is is a minor contributor. Okay. 
So a little bit about treatment of uh, industrial wastewater or refinery wastewater. It's uh, similar in a lot of ways to municipal wastewater. Um, there's processes to remove things like ammonia and hydrogen sulfide. There's oil water um, uh, uh, separators, uh, separation and removal, uh, biological treatment, uh, clarifiers and, and flocculators and uh, coagulants are used by some uh, of the refineries, but not all of the refineries. Secondary treatment has been in place at refineries since the 1970s. And as Robert mentioned, uh, granulated activated carbon or activated carbon treatment uh, has been in place at all of the Bay Area refineries since the 1990s. Uh, that might, might seem like the norm here in the Bay Area, but it's actually um, uh, unique or somewhat unique to California. Most refineries in other parts of the country don't have that. Uh, and again, it's mostly to treat for toxicity. Uh, pollutants for the most, other pollutants for the most part are um, low concentrations and controlled in refinery effluents. And then um, in the 1990s, as Robert mentioned, there was advanced treatment put in place to remove selenium, which was very effective. There's also some disinfection that goes on because sanitary waste is often uh, discharged into the system from the refinery. But again, contaminants are largely removed from the waste stream. <coughs> Also, as Robert mentioned, selenium, when you look at the, the list of pollutants uh, in the Bay and those which have TMDL, selenium is the one that's probably of most importance in refinery effluent and in industrial wastewater is, is a source. Again, the largest load is from the Delta. Uh, the white sturgeon is a key indicator of selenium impairment. It's a species that preys on clams and um, other bottom-dwelling invertebrates. It's susceptible and sensitive to um, bioaccumulation of selenium. And... Um, in the recent years, the RMP has focused uh, quite a bit of effort on improving our information and knowledge base on impairment related to selenium. The refineries have paid a, played a central role in improving this understanding of selenium in the North Bay um, by participating in and sponsoring uh, monitoring studies, collaboration with the Water Board on the TMDL and other work, and work group participation at the, at the RMP. And I want to acknowledge not here today, but Sarah Hughes from Shell, who was instrumental in bringing in some knowledge and technical resources to help us in these efforts. Oops. So just to go over some of the activities that have taken place in the last um, many years on um, for studies for selenium and work group activities. Uh, in um, uh, 2012, the refinery sponsored a study. It was conducted by TetraTech called the North San Francisco Bay Selenium Characterization Study. Um, data was collected on selenium speciation. Like Robert mentioned, the speciation of selenium is very important in terms of bioaccumulation and toxicity. And so that study was sponsored. And they also developed a model called the ECOS-3 model in 2015. That information, both from the North San Francisco Bay Selenium Characterization Study and the ECOS-3 model, went into development of the North Bay Selenium TMDL which was adopted in 2016. Even before uh, the TMDL was adopted, uh, there was a recognition that we were going to need to collect data to monitor compliance with the TMDL. And uh, so we embarked on some work on muscle plug studies. I'll talk a little bit more about that. That's basically a non-lethal method of sampling muscles, um, mu muscle plugs from sturgeon, sa sampling their tissues without destroying uh, the fish. Of course, a very important fishery, so that was a very important study to see if we could correlate fillet concentrations with muscle plug concentrations and have that as a method. So we've been collaborating, the RMP has been collaborating with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife beginning in 2014 and is currently working to continue expanding this critical data set. We also leveraged uh, a, a fishing derby that happens every year in February on Super Bowl Sunday, uh, the Super Bowl Sturgeon Derby. And so that was three years of sampling of sturgeon. So again, this is a way to get some data without going out and destroying, you know, a valuable fishery like the sturgeon that fish were already being caught. So we were able to collect muscle plugs and fillets and compare that data and also collect some other tissue, tissues. Um, Sarah Hughes brought in uh, Vince Palace. I'll talk about that a little bit more to do some work on fin rays and otoliths. And then bird eggs have been monitored actually for about 19 years. So the sturgeon derby, again, was to develop methods or continue to develop methods for non-lethal sampling of white sturgeon tissues. 
um, for selenium analysis. But we also um, looked at another method, which was collecting fin rays, uh, engaging Dr. Vince Pallas from University of Manitoba, who had this expertise. And he came out and worked with RMP staff to collect the fin rays. Fin rays have a regular annual growth pattern. Concentration of selenium and other elements can be measured in the annual rings and assembled into a time series. These data can be used to help us better understand the relationship between water, prey, and surgeon tissue concentrations. We also were able to collect otoliths at the time for a comparative analysis of the chemical stability between the otoliths and the fin ray samples. So this is a lot of data on this uh, on this figure, but this shows um, sort of a compilation of all of our data on selenium in sturgeon uh, in different from different studies. And you'll see on the left here, uh, there's uh, selenium concentrations in sturgeon over time. The circles are fillets, the, the triangles are plugs, and um, then it shows the, the different studies from 1990 on. And you can see that also it's got the selenium uh, TMDL target for the North Bay TMDL of 11.8 um, parts per million on the, the graph. The long-term data set in, in um, sturgeon uh, muscle generated by the RMP and other programs shows that concentrations were relatively high, 89 and 90, before the reductions, uh, the additional treatment to reduce uh, selenium by the refineries, and then it was fairly constant in years after that. And um, in general, the mean concentrations are um, at or below the 11.8 um, part per million in um, sturgeon muscle that is the TMDL target. Uh, on, the, on the right side, you can see um, a summary of just the data from the muscle plug study from um, 2015 to 2017. So we, there was some more intensive monitoring of sturgeon and muscle plugs performed during that time. Uh, the 2015 and 2016 occurred during the last two years of our five-year drought. And long-term monitoring of clams has shown that dry years are associated with higher selenium concentrations, wet years with lower selenium concentrations. And then you can see in 2017, we had a very wet winter and the concentrations went down. The RMP is continuing to monitor selenium and muscle plugs on a biennial basis, and I'll talk about that a little bit um, more. So following this, uh, the, the adoption of the TMDL and some additional work by the RMP to better understand impairment and how to, how to monitor selenium and other parameters, it was decided that we needed a comprehensive uh, strategy for uh, the development, um, develop a comprehensive strategy for selenium monitoring in North Bay. And uh, we developed two goals for that program. One was to um, identify leading indicators of change. So change being uh, things like uh, changes in refinery inputs, stormwater loads, Central Valley hydrologic conditions, algae levels, et cetera. And then to identify the key indicators that we should monitor for water quality conditions in the North Bay to see uh, that kind of change. And, to, and we did a statistical analysis to determine the number of samples that would be needed and be robust enough to detect a change in a reasonable amount of time. So the North Bay uh, selenium monitoring design includes three indicators, surface water or water column samples, clams, and sturgeon, and leveraged some work that was done prior by Robin Stewart and others at USGS. Uh, the, uh, there are two existing stations up in the delta with the yellow um, squares. Then there were also um, some samples uh, that USGS has uh, typically sampled 4.1 and 8.1, the red, or the, excuse me, the orange circles, and those are the samples that were targeted by the RMP to sample in the North Bay monitoring design, and then there were six uh, new sample locations or pro, pro sample locations in the Delta. And this is the general monitoring design. So again, three parameters, water column, bivalves or clams, and sturgeon tissue. And uh, again, the RMP was taking responsibility for the monitoring at stations 4.1 and 8.1, and also in sturgeon, sturgeon monitoring in the Sassoon and San Pablo Bays. That's the work we're doing in conjunction with California Fish and Wildlife. So for water column and bivalve tissues, they targeted, uh, we've targeted six months worth of samples, three months 
before the fall collection of uh, the sturgeon plugs. So, so to get a, a snapshot of clams and water right before we collect those fish samples. And then the other samples are in the spring, right before the spawning of the sturgeon in the spring. So there's three months and then a lag and then three months. And then the sturgeon tissue again is done in the fall. Every other year, we target 60 muscle plugs for that evaluation. And currently, um, we're just sort of kicking off this program. And so we're in really a kind of a pilot phase. As we get additional data, we'll evaluate the sampling design and we may adjust. And that's kind of the beauty of the RMP. We do that constantly. So future work and challenges. Uh, we want to evaluate the results of the Selenium monitoring program. Again, this is a pilot, so it's entering its second year, so we'll be refining that as needed. Uh, the other um, one of the other challenges for refineries coming up is that uh, there's there's a revision of the national effluent limitations guidelines and standards that's required by the Clean Water Act Section 304B, and so EPA may issue additional uh, requirements to enhance treatment technologies. Water reuse and recycling is also a challenge for the refineries in the future uh, to evaluate on, uh, opportunities on an ongoing basis for recycling and reuse. And it was mentioned by Robert that Chev Chevron Richmond Refinery has been able to build the capacity to meet over half of its water supply with recycled municipal water from East Bay Mud. Water is used in cooling towers and is makeup water for boilers. As another example, Phillips 66 plans to re recycle the vast majority of their effluent and reuse it in the refining process. And several other refineries are able to use treated effluent in fire protection and firefighting. Sea level rise and climate change are also challenges for the refineries. Of course, they all are along the edge of the bay. So being along the edge of the bay, important for them to conduct vulnerability analyses and uh, adaptive management. So again, the refineries have been a big part of participating in the RMP, and we look forward to that for years to come. Thank you. All right, forget my uh, shiny head. Um, my name is Josh uh, Gravenmeyer. I work with Arcadis. Uh, I've been working with Bridget pretty much 30 years, too. Uh, it's good to see a lot of uh, friendly faces out there. Um, some of the stuff that we're going to talk about now relates to dredging. It is a, uh, a sink in all of these discharges, and uh, it is part of the pathway because you do dredging related to it, and it gets moved from location to location. One thing I always like to say is it's really not a waste. It's, it's, a, it's a, something that we want to beneficially, beneficially reuse. So... I look forward to hearing uh, our speakers talk about that. And uh, uh, our first one is going to be uh, uh, Javier Fernandez, who's the new chief at the Water Board in the Planning Division. And uh, he's responsible for a number of board programs, including water quality standards, TMDLs, and dredging permits, which is why he's here. And an uh, uh, interesting fact, as I was reading his bio, is that uh, he got an MS from in, uh, uh uh, San uh, University of San Francisco in, in environmental management, as did I. So uh, we didn't know that we knew each other as much as we did until we saw each other earlier. So, how are you? Just to be clear, I, I'm, I'm chief of the planning division, not the water board. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Josh also didn't mention that I used to work with his wife about 20 years ago, too. So we have a lot of connections. I'm here to give uh, the regulatory perspective on dredging. Quick overview of my talk, I'm gonna give uh, the origin of the long-term uh, management strategy program. Uh, I'm gonna also go over the goals of long-term management strategy. And then I'm gonna talk about how the RMP can, uh, uh, has supported regulatory decisions. And then I'm gonna go into uh, an increasing focus for the regulatory community, and that's an increasing need for beneficial reuse as Josh mentioned, it's, it's a, you can think of it as a commodity, a resource. And then last, I'm going to talk about how the RMP can uh, support regulatory decisions in the future. In days of yore, 
before the LTMS, permitting was not coordinated across the agencies. During the 70s and 80s, most dredge material uh, was disposed of at a site in the Central Bay just off of Alcatraz, uh, where dispersion and eventual transport through the Golden Gate and out to the ocean was expected. Uh, however, in late 1992, um, you'll see in the upper, whoops, wrong button, uh, over here in the upper right, they found a mound. Well, what did that mean? That meant that more dredge material is being disposed there than could be dispersed. Around the same time, fishing community and uh, the environmental groups became concerned about the impacts of dredging on fisheries and other uh, ecological receptors. And then in 87 and 88, there was a sudden decrease in fishing success in the Central Bay, which just heightened this, this uh, concern. However, as I think John will point out, the uh, industry and commerce still needed to dredge. This all came to a head in 1989, where you see the, the blockade here uh, of fishing boats in, and the Alcatraz disposal site, which prevented um, disposal. So in 1990, EPA, BCDC, Army Corps, and the Water Board got together with the other resource agencies and the dredging stakeholders, and they came up with a plan, the long-term management strategy, in order to address um, these dredging concerns. Okay, come on. Next slide. There we go. That's right. Well, now two slides. <laughs> All right, I get it one of these days. Okay, how can how, how has the RMP helped us to date? The re, the regulators and make actually goals. Here we, here we are. Maybe it was three slides. Goals of the MT, LTMS program. Um, first goal is maximize use of dredge material as a resource, beneficial reuse. Uh, the second is conduct dredge material disposal in the most environmentally sound manner. The third is to establish a cooperative permitting framework, which became known as the Dredge Materials Management Office. And the last goal was maintain channels necessary for navigation and eliminate unnecessary dredging. I see John smiling over here because he may have noticed I switched the order of these as they are normally presented. And these are co-equal goals, but I decided to switch the order not only because it's a regulatory perspective, but also because the RMP really helps us with the first two uh, more than the latter two. That brings us to how the RMP actually helps us with these making regulatory decisions and dredging. Uh, the first occurred in the 90s when they developed ambient concentrations. These are real, these are useful because we use them in a weight of evidence approach for making suitability determinations. And then in 2015, they were updated, which is excellent because we need to have the most up-to-date science for making our regulatory decisions. Another uh, project that the RMP took on was a, it synthesized uh, PCB uh, data for us from the DMMO database. And this was used to address uh, priority questions related to PCBs. For the water board, our, our key take home was that it confirmed one of our assumptions in our PCB uh, TMDL. And that was that dredging resulted in next net export of PCBs outside of the Bay system. The last uh, study that was done, we, we call this a phase study. It was uh, developing standardized toxicity reference values. This first phase of the study went into the Army Corps database and tried to develop toxicity reference values. These are values that we use in evaluating bioaccumulation testing. So it's part of that weight of evidence approach to determine suitability. And what phase one did was it identified some preliminary toxicity reference values that we, we can now uh, refine uh, for future use. Now, what has become one of the priority uh, issues uh, for the regulatory agencies, and that is the increasing need for beneficial reuse. We have rising sea levels as well as a decreased uh, sediment supply. The RMP monitoring, uh, which was performed by USGS, uh, identified that 
the bay has less sediment. It, it has gone from being a transport limited to a supply limited system. Then when you couple that with the Ocean Protection Council's rising seas update in 2017, which indicated that sea levels at the Golden Gate would rise between 1.6 and 3.4 feet uh, under the current trajectory of greenhouses, which is most likely going to happen because we're not really seeing a slowdown in greenhouse gases. You get a perfect storm with the, the, mar the marshes over here are going to get flooded and eroded and no longer exist. This is a graphic I, I stole from uh, uh, Julie Beagle. It's uh, Shifting Shorelines. Her and her team uh, put together that report. And what it shows is that in the face of uh, rising sea levels in areas uh, where you have high sediment supply over here, there's a chance for marshes to keep up because they'll either accrete or even potentially expand as sea levels rise. However, over on, on your right, you'll see where there's not a lot of sediment supply. Marshes will either transgress up as shown uh, in the upper right corner, or they'll get squeezed out and essentially no longer exist. And if you can pull up a Bay Area map, you'll realize that many of our marshes are here because we have levees with urbanized development on the other side, and sometimes we have uh, sheer uh, steep headlands that prevent that transgression up. And here's some of the positive news. Just direct, or beneficial reuse is a mechanism that we can use to create high sediment in areas that would not otherwise have high sediment supply. So we can augment the sediment supply in order to create those systems where there's accretion and potentially expansion. And this can be done through uh, direct placement in diked marshes. I have trouble with this button. Uh, right here, and that's uh, Hamilton. And that's used to fill the dike valence and to increase the speed of restoration activities. And then I actually found one site. Uh, it's not in the bay. It's uh, over at uh, Butano Marsh, right here, where they place sediment directly into the marsh surface. And that can be used to maintain marsh elevations. These, these don't come without challenges. So if you're going to try and do this, you have endangered species issues that you have to deal with. If you're doing um, either one of them, you have to pump the sediment off in long distances, which takes a lot of time and a lot of money. Of course, time is money, so it's kind of the same. And the other thing is sometimes you have dredging going on, but you don't have a site ready to accept it. So the timing is a little bit off. So that makes this a bit challenging for the, the direct placement. This next slide, I'm, I show a graphic. There's, it shows all the ways that we know of at this moment for uh, beneficially reusing sediment. The first is the direct placement. I'm going to focus on uh, strategic placement, and that is placing sediment outside of marshes in order to help um, keep marsh elevations high enough. The first is uh, water column seeding. And that is actually placing sediment at the mouth of feeder channels as the tides are coming in and then the tides bring in the sediment and distribute it onto your marsh surface for you. So there's a little bit less pumping there. The other is shallow water placement. That's over here. And that's going just offshore of marshes and placing the sediment at that location. It doesn't involve, it doesn't necessarily need to involve pumping. It might involve pumping. It also has the advantage of maintaining mud flats, which we recently found not only do you have to maintain the marsh surface here, but you actually have to maintain the mud flats out front. Otherwise, you'll lose both. Now, future support that the RMP can provide. The first is, is helping us to update the uh, beneficial reuse uh, screening guidelines. We recently had a workshop um, that we had uh, stakeholders come to, and uh, the first thing they said is, well, you should use the latest ambient values. And I appreciate that because we'll, that's something we can do right away. We have ambient values from 2015, so we'll, we'll do that. 
The next thing they suggested was to um, revise uh, how we used them and, and, and to use different ways to evaluate risk. And they mentioned risk quotients and uh, floating uh, percentiles. And, and those are something that the RMP could really help us develop. And the last is, is more for the regulatory is really to look at the framework for evaluation. And that's something that was very valuable for us to learn because maybe there's different ways we can, we can do this weight of evidence approach to make it more efficient for everyone. This, the second study is, is the TRV study. Again, it sounds funny. We did the phase one, right? Well, the phase one identified preliminary TRVs based on an Ar Army Corps database. It didn't have an sufficient data for us to feel completely confident in them, but what it did do is it, it, it gave us the next steps that we needed to take in order to refine those TRVs for use. There are other databases we can go to. We can look at peer review literature to help supplement the data from the Army Corps database in order to refine those TRVs so that we could use them. It also let us know that there's contaminants that weren't necessarily in that database that could use TRVs. So we could do a broader search and maybe find some literature that would help us develop those TRVs, which again, would help us with uh, evaluating the uh, bioaccumulation and would help speed along uh, permitting processes and uh, improve and increase hopefully beneficial reuse. The third one is to evaluate the bioaccumulation for PCBs. This is this one's actually pretty simple. Uh, the current bioaccumulation trigger for PCBs is based on ambient. In, uh, in the water board's TMDL for PCBs, we included another number. It's about, uh, oh, I think, 11, uh, 11 ppb higher, I want to say. It's, so it's, it's not that different. So this study would evaluate whether there was any real difference between uh, those two two numbers when it comes to bioaccumulation. And if there really isn't a different, significant difference, then we should just go with the higher one and help to reduce the testing because that would, again, help to uh, facilitate and uh, beneficial reuse and expedite permitting for everyone. And then there's the enhancing DMMO database. So the RMP manages the DMMO base, uh, database. There's a lot of potential with this. The first is, is updating, uh, updating beneficial reuse screening guidelines. We can look at some uh, data there, perhaps, and uh, come up with those risk quotients. It, also, the bioaccumulation trigger for PCBs is another place where we can mine the DMMO database. In addition to that, we could also look at it along with other data from the RMP and perhaps help to, to identify uh, sources and hotspots. And then lastly, uh, I, I threw this one in here without talking to anybody, but um, <laughs> we could assess the efficacy of strategic placement. Why not? We don't really know whether water column seeding, how effective that is. We don't really know how this shallow water placement, we, we think it, it should work based on processes, but we need some successful test cases, because uh, it really could be that some of those uh, strategic placement, they may help us overcome some of the challenges we have with uh, beneficial reuse. And from a regulator, regulator's perspective, anything that increases beneficial reuse is a good thing. That question. Thanks, Javier. And uh, we're going to switch now to uh, our next speaker, John Coleman. Um, first and foremost, he wants to let you know that he's a uh, an Eagle Scout master. And because uh, uh, so, I'd asked him, what did he want? Uh, and none of that is written on here. But um, what I know John from is primarily from the Bay Planning Coalition. Uh, where he's the chief executive officer, and I serve as the uh, the chair of the dredging and beneficial reuse committee. And it was great to see Javier all the uh, items that you had on here, and how the Bay Planning Coalition is working with uh, the regulators to help find those solutions uh, going forward. And 
uh, John is not only in with VPC, but is part of the East Bay MUD. And so if you want to know about your water related to the power and all that, he can ask you that too. And uh, uh, I guess uh, one last shameless plug while I have you here is if you're interested in dredging, we're going to have a dredging workshop on October 24th at the Port of San Francisco. Reach out to me or John, and we have a really good program that dives into all of these kinds of issues. And John, please. Josh, thank you. I don't have any PowerPoint slides. I'm not a uh, scientist or anything else, and you need the slides for that. I'm going to talk more about policy. For those who know me, you know, I can be direct. I'm planning on being direct today. And um, it's also really nice to see some people I haven't seen for a while, like Rebecca. I used to work with her when she was at Aqua, and then I'm seeing some of my counterparts from East Bay Mud here and others that I'm on the RMP with. BPC's role in dredging. Well, we were founded in 1983, and our first executive director, Ellen Donick, as I know here, I saw her walk in, and she was in that capacity for a number of years. I've been in, been in it for about eight years. Why do we need to dredge? Well, if we don't, our economy is going to go down the tank, bottom line. And I'll be very direct. We're not doing enough dredging, and we're not doing enough use of the sediment for beneficial reuse. We're now facing, with climate change, the, as it's been talked about earlier, the impacts along our shoreline. And one of the things that we can be doing is using that sediment, the clean sediment for beneficial reuse for shoreline resiliency. And we're getting way, we're going, we're losing, get, we're losing at the game. As Warner Chabot talks about, we're way behind. And if we keep at that track, so by the time we try to get caught up and protect our shoreline assets, the reason BCDC was founded to protect the bay, we're going to start having to put stuff into the bay that we would not have thought of having to put into the bay in order to protect the assets that are so critical to our economy. Not everybody understands the importance of dredging. I was in, uh, amazed when I got here some eight years ago. I started talking about dredging, and people said, oh, my God, you can't do that. It's horrible. It's horrible for the environment, yada, yada, yada. And then I had to start – we started to change the focus – we're still very much pro-dredging at BPC, but the fact of the matter is we start talking about movement of goods, movement of people, and then that came, then they understood the economic value. And so I'm going to drill into a little bit of that and then also drill into some of the challenges and opportunities that we're facing. And there's some hypocrisy out there. The Corps of Engineers has a San Francisco Bay Regional Dredge Management, Material Management Plan. Well, there's people who are fighting it. And they're not fighting it for the reason they're not being up front. They want to shut down the refineries. That's why they're fighting it. And I'll talk about what the economic impact to the refineries are as well to um, our region. First of all, our start state ranks in the top 10 global economies of the world. We're between England and France. The Bay Area is the strongest economic sector in the state of California for economic growth. Much of that is due to the products that are produced and moved in and out of our bay and the trade that goes along with it. Um, the Port of Oakland, it's the fifth busiest container port in the United States. Over 70,000 indirect and direct jobs are attributable to the Port of Oakland. Those are good union paying living wage jobs that people don't realize that if we, the Channel Harbor is not deep enough and they're light loading the ships or they decide to go elsewhere to load and unload, those jobs are going to disappear. Port of Stockton supports 5,500 jobs. The Port of Redwood Cities, over 600 jobs. And these are critical aspects of why we need to make sure that we continue to dredge. Now I'm going to get into something maybe some of you are not going to agree with me on, and that's fine. Oil and gas, and it's been dealt with. Bridget talked about in the slide how there's 88,000 indirect and direct jobs. There's 7,000 direct jobs related to the five refineries. $3 billion in labor comes from those jobs into the Bay Area economy. One out of every $5 in revenue into the Bay Area economy comes from the oil and gas industry. And whether we like it or not, 92% of all the transportation energy use comes from those five refineries. And our airports in Travis the fuel that generates what they need to do comes from the refineries as well. So we can't just shut everything down like some people would like in a, in a perfect world. Maybe it could, but we don't live in a perfect world. We know that. And so we have to do things differently, but we need to do things and we may need to make changes. From an environmental standpoint, 
dredging is pro-environment. And you're going, my God, how could it be pro-environment? Well, it is. If you're taking clean sediment out of the bay and reusing it for beneficial reuse, that is protecting the assets. It's creating marshland. It's helping the aquatic life. It's helping the birds. It's helping the economy. And it's, it's protecting what's being lost as the sea level rises. And so we can either do that or we can put in cement, metal, uh, garbage like they used to do into the bay. That's not what we want to do. We want to put in uh, dredge material that is clean and we need to um, start doing, looking at it from that perspective. There are obstacles though for dredging. Permitting takes too damn long. Fish windows are needed from a standpoint of protecting the species, absolutely. But we need to have flexibility when looking at the fish windows and really tracking when the fish are moving in and out and when we can and cannot do it. The clarity of disposal sites needs to be, it's ambiguous. One year it's this way, the next year it's another way. What is it? Is it going to be in bay? No, not likely, unless it's for shoreline resiliency. Out in the ocean, 61 miles, which is costly, or upland, which is also can be costly, but it's also important from an environmental standpoint. We need to look at funding for incremental cost of beneficial reuse because it has an economic benefit to use that material. We need to look at the evolving environmental concerns forcing the exclusion of cost-effective methods of dredging without looking at the cost-benefit ratio of what it does. And also we need to look at, for example, something, the people, whether it be the core or a private uh, dredger goes in, they dredge it and then a shoal appears. All of a sudden you have a bump. And Sometimes you can uh, take that bump out, other times you can't. And one of the things that's a problem we have right now, uh, it's litigation that's going on. They're doing one harbor and then another channel and for the refineries. Well, these ships are being light loaded. Well, that means more ships are coming in with less fuel because the more products in the ship, the heavier the ship, it's going to be hitting the bottom. That means we're producing more air pollution. We're also increasing the chance of an accident on the bay, quite frankly. and that is, the ships are going to come in, so oh, do we want to do it from an environmental standpoint? Yes. Do we want to protect the economy and the environment? Yes. So we need to get that issue resolved soon, and that has to get out of the courts. The opportunities for dredge material align the funding stream for flood control or environmental restoration to fund the cost of increment and beneficial reuse. That needs to be evaluated. We need to work. Uh, we have worked with, for example, uh, RMP on the fee structure for dredging. Last year, we came to terms and conclusion on that. We work with BCDC on uh, their areas. Now, do we always agree with the core, BCDC, or the Regional Water Board? No, we don't. But we are going to be in the room. We're going to be a partner. We want to make sure that we can add value in that process And when we're doing that. Um, we support effective and significant change in dredging regulations and shoreline policy in order to promote resilient shorelines, restored habitats, and, the, and navigable waterways. Again, if those waterways are not deep enough, we're increasing the chance of an accident in the bay. That means we're increasing the chance of products being polluting the bay. And uh, it's also, quite frankly, we're driving up the cost of the products that you and I are buying and other people are buying. We may be lucky. We probably are in that el element of the economic chain here where we can afford a lot of these things. A lot of the people in the Bay, Bay Area are struggling economically, and incremental costs of change, whether it be fuel or food, is hard on them. And they're looking elsewhere. They're moving elsewhere. And so good, talented people are leaving the Bay Area because we're not taking into account what we have to do is to deal with the economic reality of some of our decisions that we're doing. Now, from a standpoint of the future, um, we have been trying to get a sponsor and legislation, and maybe some of you can help us here. We want legislation done in Sacramento to conduct an economic benefit analysis study of why the state of California should help on dredging and beneficial reuse. We are the only coastal state in the United States where the state of Cal does not provide any money for dredging. You go to the south, you go to the southeast, in the northwest, they do, we do not. So we're losing the economic advantage of being able to bring ships in here and products and jobs. A shipper is going to look at what the costs are to bring a ship in. And if the ship is getting more light loaded and not carrying as much product, they're going to go to Portland, Seattle, going to go with the expanded Panama Canal, 
into the Gulf Coast. We want those jobs here because they're great paying jobs for people who are trying to live and sustain their families. Now, there's one thing that's really concerning me. It hasn't been talked about, and I was at the microplastics conference last week that SFEI put on. And I talked with a few dredgers and some scientists. I said, are you talking about, are you looking at what the microplastics may do from a standpoint of beneficial reuse? And they're not. We know that most of the microplastics come from storm events and uh, they set, it settles into the bay. And those microplastics can be caught cancer causing agents. And if we're putting them on the shoreline, are we then creating a greater problem for the food chain by doing that? This is an issue at some point, potentially, from a regulatory standpoint or a litigation standpoint, you could have somebody saying you can't use sediment, clean sediment, for shoreline resiliency because it's having an impact on the food chain, and that's going to then have an economic impact on our shoreline resiliency. The things that we don't think about, the, the wastewater treatment plants, the homes, the businesses the, getting on to and off of a bridge, how are we going to protect those assets? We have a lot of challenges. We have a lot of opportunities. The Bay Planning Coalition looks very much forward to participating with the agencies, the regulatory agencies, and the other NGOs. But the old way doesn't necessarily mean it's the right way. We need to be willing to look at things differently, test things. That was talked about a, a while ago. Maybe a different paradigm has to be approached when looking at things and say, okay, we're going to take a little bit of a reach of a test and see if it can be done. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't, doesn't work. But if we don't do anything, that sure as hell is not working either. So my comment is we have a lot of opportunities. We have challenges. And working together, I think we can overcome them. But it's a matter of working together and sometimes not having our blinders on and saying it has to be done this way. Let's look this way. Let's look this way and see how we can do it. That. Thank you. Well, John, uh, you definitely didn't hold any punches. Uh, thank you for your opinion. And we'd like to invite all the speakers from the session now to come uh, down to the front so we can have a question and answer period. And if you have any burning questions yourselves that you want to talk uh, with the panel, uh, uh, now's your time to do so. Yeah, this question is just for Bridget. With regards to sturgeon, has anyone thought about looking at tracking the sturgeon? They're pretty mobile fish and they move all throughout the delta. And with regards to foraging on prey items with selenium, they're found in the lower South Bay, which is more of a shrimp-based um, food web. So I just want to know if anyone's looked into that. Uh, yes, we. Yeah, talk into it. Can you hear me? Um, Yes, we did look at that um, early on when we were talking about different studies uh, for the sturgeon. There has been some work done by UC Davis, I believe, and a couple other organizations to do some radio telemetry in the Bay. And we did at one point look at some of that information and data. So we have considered it, but it's not currently on our list of studies for the RMP. I had another question on selenium. Um, uh, there's in light of um, in light of recent research indicating existing loads result in significant impacts to sensitive species. Um, is there a plan to update uh, the TMDL for selenium? And if not, why not? Where's Barbara? <laughs> Where is Barbara? <laughs> she here? Barbara, over there. Passing the buck. Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> um, uh, we're still collecting data, but as far as I can say right now, we don't have a clear evidence that white sturgeon is impacted by selenium uh, to a degree that it would require us looking again at the um, targets uh, that were used to develop the selenium TMDL. And um, the most recent... Um, EPA uh, um, uh, criteria established or proposed for both freshwater and um, marine waters in San Francisco Bay and um, 
in the creeks and, and rivers in California still rely on the same um, uh, fish tissue concentrations. Um, so I think that as um, Bridget um, this, um, described, we are looking at various um, studies and various ways of collecting data to um, make certain that um, sturgeon is not impacted by the current selenium levels. Um, but obviously, we I can't say that we know everything that there is to know. So um, it's, we are hoping we're not just, we haven't just developed the TMDL and, and say everything was fine. Uh, the reason why we, we are still spending a lot of money on um, designing and collecting additional data is to be sure that um, what we have proposed um, is still working. Um, I'm curious, so with uh, sea level rise adaptation being an increasing uh, concern for especially shoreline facilities, um, and maybe Julie will speak to this in the next session, but what are some of the adaptation strategies that are being considered? I mean, we've heard a lot about dredging and, and reuse. Um, are the refineries participating in conversations about adaptation strategies, or what's, what's going on in that area? call on Maureen to talk specifically about <laughs> what the refineries are doing. I know they're doing vulnerability analyses, but are there other things you can mention, Maureen? Well, I would say, you know, we're starting to address them as they come up in our permits. So we have requirements and when we've done work at our wharf, we have to address it in terms of sea level rise and how we're maintaining the wharf. Um, we also have it in our WDR uh, permits right now for anything that's a remediated site, we have to address that. So we're addressing it as it comes up in our permits, but so far it's not in our wastewater permits. So, so, so I mean, actually, I can answer. You can answer. Uh, so, uh, more specifically, not necessarily to uh, refineries, but um, strategies in general, which uh, Julie uh, is going to go through the Adaptation Atlas, which is a blueprint for how to use nature-based approaches to adaptation in the Bay Area. So um, thank you for letting me make a plug for Julie. Um, <laughs> and there, it, it depends on where you're at. So it, it, I, I once heard a talk, and the answer is always, it depends. And there are areas where you're going to have to use gray infrastructure. Um, you take like uh, San Francisco shoreline. There's not a lot that can be done there using nature-based approaches. So you might need to do some seawalls, but there are ways to build seawalls that are actually more uh, environmentally friendly. You can put little crenulations in the wall itself, which gives little hiding places for sessile organisms, which then increases the population of the sessile organisms, which are food for fish, and that increases the fish populations. That's the way to be a little more environmentally friendly with a gray infrastructure. You can also go more toward, in some areas, there can be more of a green solution where you can do a, like a horizontal levy because you have space uh, to do that sort of thing. So you look at the South Bay Shoreline project and they're doing more of a horizontal levy, which is a very gradual slope that leads down to uh, the, the marsh, which then allows the marsh, as I, if you remember that graphic I showed you, will allow it to um, transgress up. There's also things like uh, coarse beaches, which is uh, one of my favorite topics where uh, you can use coarse gravel or shell hash in order to reduce wave energy, which then can help maintain marshes that um, can rise uh, if you have enough sediment uh, with sea level rise. There's, there's more, and I, I think I will, will stop there because Julie is going to talk later, and hopefully she'll go a little more into some of these things. Take our report. Oh, we, sorry. That's my boss, so I'm going to say this. <laughs> um, actually, the, the, coming up um, in this week, potentially, or early next week, we, we did write a, a climate change report. It's drafted. It's been reviewed. We're incorporating comments, and it's going to be released any day now. And it goes through uh, a lot of these topics, and it talks about what we're first going to do for policy change, and it's, it's going to be to address 
um, dredge and fill policies in order to help increase and facilitate beneficial reuse and allow for uh, adaptation. It, so look for that. Uh, it may, may be out tomorrow and may be out early next week. Well, I had a uh, I had a comment for uh, John Coleman, and this is just a comment uh, regarding you know uh, you talked about jobs and uh, employment and how many and I do not think all of us here are objecting to having work. We all work, but it is uh, simply trans translating how and what we work for in an environment that is what is important. So we may, it may have, there may be a lot of jobs that are generated nowadays because of how the industry runs, but eventually that is going to create problems from us going forward for our children or grandchildren. So in that context, I think the industry needs to change also. It is not simply about having jobs right now, but having jobs in the future and being well enough to do those jobs. I don't disagree with you, and I should have predicated my remarks by saying we all live here for a reason. We like the Bay. We love the environment. We like the opportunities. Nobody here wants to see that go away. Industry has done a phenomenal job over the years, now sometimes due to regulatory pressures and other times due to changes that they institute themselves, to actually promote more environmental green policies, and they have been on the forefront and supporting a lot of these. Unfortunately, when I lived, talked about that litigation, that litigation could impact AD, not AD, well, I mean, the worst case, it could in, in, impact a lot of jobs of people who have lived here for a long time and are raising families. And that has to be taken into account. You just can't say, we're going to get rid of everything because we want to. You have to have a backup plan. And yeah, if we can go more towards the green direction, absolutely. And we're seeing it in some sectors of the energy uh, in California already with windmills and solar. And it's shown, contrary to what the president is saying, that it is successful. But we, all, we just can't throw the water out the window and assume everything's going to be okay. From a policy perspective, I'm on the East Famo Water Board. If I were to do that and we didn't, for example, plan uh, over $200 million for seismic upgrades and we know a major earthquake is going to come and we didn't plan for it, we would be at fault in as much as uh, pg and is being criticized now for what they're doing. But from a standpoint of regulatory, trying to keep jobs as jobs evolve and change, yeah, that's great. But just don't get rid of the jobs. And that's where some people are coming from. Um, in attending various meetings over, over the years, uh, for quite a while I've been hearing about beneficial reuse of dredging, and there's been Jim Levine's project, and there's been Hamilton Field, and which are to some extent, I would say, one-offs. And now we have the BCDC decision, which may be quite important, and apparently there's some report coming. I still don't see that there is a... Um, uh, any real progress toward integrating this into what we are doing around the Bay. That's a little harsh, but can anybody give me a better sense of real hope? That's, I apologize, that's not an RMP question. I'll take a stab. I think BCDC needs to be applauded for what they're doing on the Bay, Bay Plan Fill Amendment that they voted on last Thursday. Uh, you know, they went from wanting to stop all fill, and you know we benefited from that. But now they're put, now they're talking about fill in strategic locations that would have economic and environmental benefits, and I think that is good. Uh, with climate change and sea level rise, we're going to be losing a lot of critical assets, including environmental assets, unless we do something. And I think BCDC in this case needs to be applauded for what they've done. I, actually, I'll, I'll respond a little bit too. It's, it's, I think that's it's very easy to fall into fatalistic sort of um, when you look at the challenges facing with, with sea level rise, and it's very easy to do. 
Um, but I think we have seen signs of success, and it's not just with beneficial reuse of dredge sediment. You look at Inner Bear Island, that was restored entirely with upland materials and using upland materials for beneficially reusing. We need to look at all of our resources uh, in order to, to make this work. And you're starting to see that um, the projects you named are, I wouldn't call them even one-offs because Bear Island also used dredge sediment from the Port of Redwood City. Cullen and Ranch is currently using um, dredge sediment. They also are uh, set up where they can accept upland sources if they really need to. You look at uh, California legislature just passed um, uh, 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 I'm not sure what it was, but it, it, it was given to, <laughs> they, they're giving money, okay, <laughs> to the Coastal Conservancy. That's the take home. They're giving money to the Coastal Conservancy. Right now, this year, Army Corps is dredging Port of Redwood City, and they're sending some of that material it was supposed to be Eden Landing. Now that's changed a few times when I talked about having a site available at the same time of dredging. Well, Cullinan's available. We also have Montezuma, as you mentioned. And so it's going to go to a different spot. But the money then, the money came from California legislature. We need more innovation like that. We need to look at upland sources. We're also in discussions with uh, some of the flood control districts, in particular um, Marin County flood control district. On, in Novato Creek, they actually dredged, well, they didn't dredge, they excavated um, for flood control purposes and they placed it in a dike marsh area near the POTW in order to um, begin planning for adapting to rising sea levels. So, you know, there, uh, you, yes, I mean, I think we could move faster and it would have been nice if we started, you know, 30 years ago, but I think we are moving in the right direction, and I think we just need to be innovative and keep on plugging. If I could maybe add to that a little bit, um, you know, the, our, our main dredger in San Francisco Bay is the Army Corps. Right. They are limited by the least cost alternative, and the least cost alternative is in bay disposal and or the ocean. So finding a solution to that, and really it's an incremental cost difference between the ocean and beneficial reuse. It's a few dollars per cubic yard. And so some of the studies that the RMP is funding and looking at, like the nearshore placement study and things right. like that, could be a way that we could potentially flip the switch. A lot of the stuff that we're using for the beneficial reuse sites, like uh, Montezuma and uh, the others, are all being predicated by projects like Chevron, right? I mean, that, that's the ones that are using. But if we flip the switch, there's a lot more material that can be used and be used quickly. And that's where the RMP can come in and help that kind of stuff. I will not compete with you, Jim. Go ahead. Well, I, I, wanna, I wanna make sure that we have a little happier context for all of this. The only, there's two advantages of getting old. You know everybody and, and you've seen almost everything. So. I go back and I think about Cullen and Ranch because I'm old enough to remember the battle over whether or not it was going to be developed. And it's on its way to restoration. Um, I, I worked with the Conservancy on Sonoma Baylands, which is now a mature marsh, which um, is nesting habitat for endangered species. Uh, and, and I've kayaked into it a, a couple of times, three times, I think. Um, these battles over the margins of the bay have been won in ways that set us well along the goal to restoring 100,000 acres of wetlands. And from what I've done with my life, that's a huge victory. Um, it's much bigger than dredge material in particular, but dredge material has a role in that. But but I think it's a little happier. And, and think about Cullen and Ranch as a shopping center and think of it as a restored wetland and we won. <laughs> yes, my, my question might be for Javier. So a lot of talk about dredge reuse, material reuse, but can you talk about upland sources a little bit and how these play in and how big of a part that is towards wetland restoration, including reservoir management, channel sediment taken out of channel? Can I talk about that some can more? You, can you talk about that? 
Okay. We talked about a lot of things for a long time. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, even if we used all the dredge sediment that we currently have for beneficial reuse, it still would not be enough to keep up with sea level rise or rising sea levels, I think is the new term. Um, so we have to start looking at other things. And the first one was really Bear Island where they, they we learned a lot from that, <laughs> um, such as, you know, you have to, to tag things in and out and keep track, otherwise you end up with asphalt in the middle of your marsh, uh, <laughs> which is not what we wanted. They removed it, but since then, a crop has been developed um, for the South Bay Shoreline, South Bay Restoration Project, and, and that's actually, they wrote it more like the, a template. So now we can easily pass that to folks uh, and they can start using that um, to create, a, QAP is a quality assurance uh, plan, by the way. Um, and that helps to facilitate that beneficial reuse. What we've really found is in upland sources, you take off the top two to three feet. You just don't even bother with it because there's uh, pesticides everywhere. And so you just take off the top two, three. Once you get into depth, you can find some cleaner materials. And that really, if it wasn't for that, Inner Bear Island would still be subsided. It would not have been breached yet. And so there, there's another success that we can talk about where that's been breached. It's well on its way to becoming a tidal marsh. When you look at, um, like Bothine Marsh and Marin and Mill Valley, there's a lot of coarse sediment in, in the creek that feeds it. It's currently not connected. Bothine Marsh is not connected to the creek. Well, one thing you could do is connect the creek and then that sediment will go into the creek or into the marsh. You could also, in the meantime, take some of that coarse sediment and put it along the shoreline and that'll help dampen wave energy, which is eroding the, the, the marsh back. Um, there's also drowning going on and that could help keep the marsh in place. So there's, there's a lot of sources of sediment out there and we, we need to, to really think about how we can keep this sediment in the system and maybe either connect uh, watersheds better in order to have it happen naturally, or in some cases we're gonna need to, to just physically move it ourselves and put it there. Otherwise, um, it, it's just not gonna happen. There's a, another pilot project we have going on right now in, uh, that NERS is doing. They actually have little test plots where they're doing what's called thin lift, lift placement. And they put that on top of vegetated marsh. It's anywhere from a foot to two feet. And the vegetation can grow up through it. And then the elevations can move up that way. Um, the challenge with that is with endangered species, the salt marsh harvest mouse and stuff, um, Fish and Wildlife Service and Department of Fish and Wildlife generally want people to mow the, mow the, uh, vegetation down and make sure there aren't any marshes there. But if you do that and add two feet, then the plants can't grow. So we need to figure out, you know, how we can do that. And there might need to be a regulatory fix there. Well, thanks for all the questions. We've run out of time. I, I knew we could keep the time going. Um, a couple of announcements. Uh, we're going to take a break now and then we'll return at uh, 245 for the next session, uh, which highlights integration with other programs. And then uh, just a reminder that after uh, the RMP meeting itself, then we'll be meeting over uh, for a, uh, a social at uh, Jupiter across the street. So look forward to seeing you after the break. Thanks for being here. Thank you for being here.